Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, starting with verse 23. Listen for the word of the Lord. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to Jesus as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You're not the boss of me. Anyone who has had any kind of experience with children who aren't their own has probably heard some version of this statement. When I was babysitting as a teenager and even sometimes as an adult, my promptings for the kids to go to bed would sometimes be met with this dose of truth. You're not my mom. True enough. I wasn't their mom or dad or even a grandparent. Who was I to tell them what they could or could not do? Who was I to push back against the argument, but my dad lets me stay up and watch one more cartoon before bed when it was actually the designated bedtime? The things that those kids often did not recognize in the heat of the moment was that I had been given that authority by their parent. And that authority, at least within the families that I was lucky enough to work for, was one that was trying to look out for them. Their reality, though, was that they didn't want to have anyone telling them what to do. And I'm not so sure we ever really grow out of that. We generally don't like being told what to do, particularly here in the United States where individual liberty is prized and celebrated so highly, we can struggle with authority. But it is still something that we understand. The idea of some people or institutions having authority or power over others was certainly familiar to the people in Jesus's time, too. And before our passage begins, Jesus has returned to Jerusalem to the Palm Sunday fanfare. He has been heralded as the son of David, the figure who had come to uplift the people of Israel. He had also gone into the temple, into the most sacred of spaces, and literally overturned the system. He flipped the tables of the money changers and the people who were selling goods in the outer temple courts, rebuking the power structure that could so easily exploit others. Jesus had also been healing people and teaching and, in general, causing quite a stir. And the relig religious leaders took notice how could they not? When they confronted Jesus in this passage, it was almost as if you could hear them asking, who do you think you are? You're not the boss of me. 
they were uncomfortable with how Jesus was behaving because Jesus operated as though he had power over them, over illness, and even over the temple itself. These leaders didn't like being told what to do, and understandably so. After all, as scholar Catherine Blanchard notes, their own authority in Israel had been given to them by God in the time of Moses and passed down for generations. So they kind of rightfully ask Jesus a question. By what authority do you do these things? But then Jesus, employing a well-known debate tactic, responded to their question with another question. Never mind about my authority, what about John the Baptist? If you can tell me by what authority John baptized people, I will tell you where my authority is from. The elders and the chief priests knew that they were trapped. No matter how they answered, those who were questioning Jesus' authority would end up having their own authority questioned. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't totally blame them for being concerned about this upstart from Galilee. They had the seminary degrees and the ordination credentials. They had the responsibility of caring for the religious life of the people in their community. And not only did they have the credentials to care for this community, they also were trying to keep the peace between the occupying Roman government and their group's identity as the people of God. Meanwhile, this guy Jesus came from nothing, but still had the audacity to question their authority. But they had to answer his question. They were backed into a corner. We don't know, they replied. So it seemed a little bit like Jesus was off the hook, but he didn't leave them there. Jesus didn't let these leaders go before he gave them a story to consider. Now, I'll be honest, as I confessed to our Bible study group this week, I had to do a little bit of work to figure out what this parable just might have to do with the authority that the first part of our passage is so centered on. The parable itself seems clear enough. A father has two sons. He tells one son to go and work on the family farm. And that son says, nah, I'm not in the mood, and puts his headphones back on. But then that son ends up going out to work later. The other son answers his father's request to work with a very polite, yes, sir, but then ends up absorbed in a video game all day instead. Jesus asks the leaders, which of the two did the father's will? Seems like there was perhaps a lack of respect on both sides, but the one who ultimately obeyed the father's request, of course, is the one who did the father's will. Actions speak louder than words. And this is true enough. Jesus himself says as much in other places, like in Matthew 7, where he teaches that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Simply saying that Jesus is Lord isn't really what Jesus is after. Actions speak louder than words. But what does this have to do with authority? In explaining the story that he just told the temple leaders, Jesus brings things back to John. John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. As a result, Jesus says that these tax collectors and prostitutes, those who in the eyes of the religious leaders had no moral authority, these are the ones going into the kingdom of God ahead of the chief priests and elders. Those who did not want to acknowledge the authority that John or that Jesus had are confronted with the reality of that very authority and the failure to acknowledge it. They had professed to accept the authority of God, but Jesus said, by refusing to listen to the message of God that was delivered through John and that was present with them in Jesus, the truth was revealed. Conversations with Jesus are dangerous, scholar Charles Campbell notes. Jesus unmasks their deepest priorities and concerns. 
Those who thought they had authority found themselves somehow lacking. They were recognizing the authority of someone, but was it the authority that God had over their lives and the life of their community or the authority that they themselves had or the authority of the government and military? Jesus seems to make a connection between the actions that are taken and the authority at play. Ultimately, the powers that we recognize help to shape decision-making and behavior. And because of this, we have to be careful about what authorities we give credence to. So what authority did they recognize? Perhaps this is the question that Jesus was really driving at during this exchange in the temple. And it is also a question that we must answer. When we claim to follow Jesus, we are saying that this authority, Jesus' authority, holds sway in our lives. So we need to know just what this authority is about. And the reading from Philippians gives us a wonderful image of what that authority looks like. Jesus's authority is one that led him to humble himself, as Paul says. He knew who he was and what he could demand, but instead of seeking that glory and reverence from others, he chose to give of himself. He showed a love that was costly and led a life that demonstrated God's reign. As a flesh and blood person, Jesus showed all who would follow who God is and what obedience to God looks like. As Jill Duffield put it in her reflections on this week's assigned texts, what this passage from Philippians reminds us is that the triune God leads us with a self-giving compassion and leads us to life-giving salvation. It is a compassion that leads to welcoming those who are often left on the margins of our society. It is a compassion that leads to healing the sick and freeing the captive and feeding the hungry. It is a compassion that leads to disrupting systems that profit unfairly off of the backs of other people. It is a compassion that is stronger than our sin and even overcomes the sting of death itself, ensuring our relationship with God. It is a compassion that calls for a response, a response which John powerfully proclaimed in the wilderness, a repentance, a changing of mind. And this change in mind leads to a change in behavior. This is the call which Jesus says the tax collectors and the prostitutes, those without authority, recognized and answered and that the respected leaders of the community were missing. For Jesus, the proof of this was in their actions. Now I want to be clear, actions can never make us worthy of God's love. That love is a gift freely given by God. But actions do matter because they show what authority we have truly yielded to. On Thursday night, many of us gathered to discuss the book, I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. And I hope that many of you have read it and will think about what she is trying to share and teach us. But before we got into our discussion groups, we watched a segment of a video uh, of a talk that Brown gave earlier this year on the nature of racial justice work. In it, she asks her listeners what they truly believe. In our minds, she says, we may think that all people are made in the image of God, but what do we believe in our hearts? Do we believe that God created everyone in the divine image? Our society, she says, would suggest that we do not believe that because we do not love black people with a reckless love. We love black people with a conditional love. This can be a little bit hard to hear, but when parents worry that their children will not get job interviews if their names do not sound like white names, such as Austin's parents did, that points to a conditional love. When we demand justice loudly when a person of color is charged with a crime, but try to make excuses for white people, like this was just a youthful mistake, that points to a conditional love. Our actions point to our deepest beliefs, which is why Jesus emphasized the importance of believing. 
Belief means action, not just confession. It can be easy at this point to feel discouraged, and I hope you'll hang with me. I imagine the elders and chief priests did too, and even a little bit ticked off. When we, like them, must answer a question to which we know the correct answer, but that we do not want to hear, as Charlotte Dudley Cleghorn put it, it's uncomfortable. But there is some good news in this Matthew passage too. Yes, it can and should convict us to take a look at what we truly believe and measure it against the image of God's reign that we see in Christ. But this story also points to an aspect of that self-giving compassion. It never gives up on us. Jesus knew from the get-go that these particular people did not accept his authority, but he engaged them anyway. Even when he had, in a sense, caught them in their own trap by refusing to answer their question, he kept speaking to them. Similarly, like the son in the parable, Jesus gives us innumerable chances to change our minds or to let the Holy Spirit change our minds, even though we might say, I won't go. The love we are shown by God in Jesus Christ is anything but a conditional love. It is a reckless love, one that pursues us without end, one that goes where love must go, even to death on a cross, in order not to be without us. This is the authority with which Jesus calls us to be his followers. This love is the authority upon which God's kingdom is built. This is an authority that shows mercy and grace and truly does want what is best for us. Sometimes I imagine myself sounding to God a bit like those kids I babysat. You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me who to love. Spoiler alert, that would be everybody. You can't tell me what to do. Another spoiler, live in ways that show justice and mercy. And maybe sometimes you feel that way too. But like those kids, in those moments, we're missing a crucial point. It's one that isn't perfectly paralleled in any human relationship because we are all flawed. Even those who are supposed to love us can hurt us. So we should not blindly follow just any authority, but it is certainly true for God. The authority which God holds is one that desires life, abundant life, eternal life. It's an authority that we can trust. And in those moments when we do trust it, we are given the beautiful gift of being empowered to change our minds. We are set free to recognize the reckless love that we have been shown, and we are set free to show that reckless love to others. And that love can show up in many different ways. Perhaps it's supporting Black-owned businesses to try to counteract just a piece of the racism that still pervades our society. Perhaps it's making eye contact with the person experiencing homelessness that we pass on the Walnut Street Bridge just so that they know they are seen. But however it looks, reckless love treats people with dignity and respect because God's authority in Christ is an authority of love and we are claimed and freed to love with a reckless love, whether or not someone deserves it. After all, that is exactly the reckless love which God loves us with. And that is an authority worth trusting. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>